Constance told me as I was setting up for th this morning's visit, she says, it's Saturday morning cartoons. You don't look very cartoony. So I said, I'll see what I can do. So I pulled the beret out. Okay. I was just going to be in my in my turtleneck, but I, why not? Good morning. Bonjour. Come with me to the Latin Quarter. And then we will Apache dance together. Maybe I better start over. <laughs> anyway, it's raining. It's right out of the blue. You know, 10-day forecast is supposed to be beautiful, everything else. All of a sudden, yesterday, looked at the two-day forecast, rain! And we'd already taken the cover off of the car and just, well, anyway, I, I took a walk in the, the rain to go get my coffee this morning, like I always do. Uh, and uh, Constance wisely wanted me to put on one of those giant prophylactic uh, ponchos that uh, even a little gust of wind breaks the snaps and I still get wet anyway. But anyway, I went out in my coat and an umbrella, got my coffee, and uh, I had made it back okay. So I'm still alive, but my clothes are all in the dryer. But you don't need to know that. Anyway, it does paint quite a picture, though. And this is Saturday morning cartoons. And uh, uh, in my uh, uh, zeal to uh, try to try to do something thematic and cartoony on uh, on Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, yesterday we did a little something kind of cartoony, but. Uh, uh, I was uh, scrolling through uh, uh, the, I, I was searching just for Saturday morning cartoons, and uh, I, I was really surprised to, uh, to see a lot of very kind of scholarly articles about the death of uh, Saturday morning cartoons. And the definition of between 1950s something uh, and 19, early 19s uh, or mid 1960s uh, was the, like the golden age when all three networks, yeah, three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, uh, had uh, from like eight in the morning to uh, uh, 11.30 or noon uh, had, had children's programming. And uh, including all the Saturday morning cartoons. Now, when I was young, when I was young, the, uh, well, when I was really young, there was no television, no commercial television to speak of. Uh, but uh, like starting in around 1953, 54, uh, there were cartoons, there were morning shows. Not only that, there were morning show for kids during the week also. Sheriff John uh, of KTLA in Los Angeles and, and uh, uh, other kinds of shows, including Howdy Doody and Kukla Fran and Ollie and things like that. And, uh, but television was such a new medium that they had to go back and not only play uh, uh, for material, the, the Warner Brothers cartoons, uh, uh, Disney sort of had a lock on Disney's own stuff. You could only watch Disney cartoons on, on Disney shows. Um, but Tom and Jerry and 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 uh, Popeyes, and the Popeyes were the old freaking Popeyes from the early early thirties. 
Not only that, but we they were still broadcasting cartoons from the silent era. So in other words, I and around the the, the introduction of sound there and that was very surrealistic and it sort of sort of uh, uh, for a child's mind, it sort of uh, uh, allowed children growing up and observing those those cartoons to sort of expand their experiential consciousness back in time before they were born. So I watched cartoons. Uh, uh, one in particular was called The Little King Cartoons. I'm sure you can you can Google and see an entire uh, episode of Little King Cartoons. And it was all silent. It was they had to use synchronized a synchronized soundtrack, but it wasn't hooked to the to the film. That's how old they were, and so the, there was there was music, and uh, instead of talking, they went. Meow, 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 meow. So you could see these little king cartoons all over the world. Language was no was no barrier, but it's very surreal, and you could tell that these freaking cartoonists were like. On dope, okay, because they were all psychedelic and and uh, uh, they're very creative and imaginative, and uh, when you look at it today, obviously very hip, okay. But anyway, I don't have any of those to show you today. I just wanted to share that story. The closest thing I do have is an episode that I wrote about in my life with the spirits. Uh, an episode concerning uh, cartoonish mythological characters, if you will, uh, leprechauns and pixies. And I've even titled my talk today, My Experience or Something with Leprechauns and, and Pixies. Now, I'm not saying that uh, uh, I was in Ireland or, or even England at the time, uh, but the, the idea of these mythological uh, folk kind of characters uh, uh, are implanted in, in all of our brains. And uh, very, very, very early on in my magical studies, uh, I started to take the BOTA tarot lessons. And... Uh, so once there was a, a bunch of preliminary monographs uh, kind of talking about the, the theory and kind of a scholarly uh, approach to it, then you actually uh, took two weeks per trump card and colored your own tarot card and uh, did little meditations and everything to go with it. Uh, and you spend two weeks on it. And it was such an ingenious idea. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, my new book that's coming out with Wiser uh, is uh, uh, allowing you the opportunity to, uh, to do that uh, uh, for, for yourself with uh, uncolored uh, version of uh, tarot ceremonial magic. I mean, spend a little time on the fool card, things like that. Um, and it's a full size thing and hopefully in the, the book will allow you to literally create, for our purposes, all 78 cards. But I digress. I wanted to be a full blown mystic. I wanted to be a first class mystic. And I was taking the, the lessons quite seriously. And, uh, you know, I joined the Rosicrucian Order of Amork and did their little, you know, home initiations and stuff. Which I tell you, for me, were pretty damn effective. 
But anyway, the very first card that I was working on was the Fool card. And uh, spent two weeks on it. And, and I was, you're obliged to actually become an amateur artist. And you spend time and you know how many roses there are. And you know why the the feather is red. And you, uh, you really spend a lot of time. And you can feel that your consciousness is being tweaked. Okay. And and uh, your dream patterns start to uh, start to change and everything else. Well, on the day I finished the fool card, my first tarot card, Aleph, something very traumatic and strange happened, and I sh share the story. Uh, I'm sure I've shared it with you before over the last two or three years, but it's from my life of the spirits. And it does deal with leprechauns, and it does deal with pixies. And I'm going to share it with you today for Saturday Morning Cartoons. Chapter 13. Nedura, N-E-D-U-R-A. Nedura and the Procession of Elves. When I was 11, I was quite impressed with an odd little Disney film called Darby O'Gill and the Little People. It's a tale of a crusty old storyteller prone to taking a nip or two, played marvelously by Albert Sharp who manages to capture the king of the leprechauns. In exchange for his freedom, the king grants him three wishes, all of which naturally backfire. It's a cute little story to, to delight 11-year-olds, but it, but it struck a deep chord in me. Oh, God, there's, there's one scene with the banshee coming in the night to take the soul of the deceased. It, it, delightfully scared the shit out of me. Somehow, uh, even though I was cynical about God and Jesus, I found it uh, easy to believe there might be some kind of truth behind the legend of elves and fairies and leprechauns. If they existed, I wanted to see them. I even tried to induce an altered state of consciousness by exhausting myself on my bicycle uh, in the secluded wilds of Pawnee Park. This is in Columbus, Nebraska. Beautiful, beautiful, large park. I, I had to ride my bike over the train viaduct, so I was just all pumped up and full of oxygen and high as a kite, and I laid out under the, under the, the pine trees way deep into the away from the road and stuff. But I digress. Uh, I never saw anything stranger than mosquitoes. Still, I might have been on the right track. It's been my experience that most of my significant mystical adventures are triggered by trauma. Perhaps this is true only for the most base and unevolved individuals those who need to be beaten over the head before they loosen up. It's certainly true for me. Very early in my magical career, following a trauma of sorts, I had a very vivid encounter with a most curious creature. The nine-month period prior to my initiation into the OTO, <clears throat> I'm going to pause to stress nine months before my initiation into the OTO. I only know this because you keep a diary record. And it only became possibly significant in my mind it was years and years and years later when I was reviewing my diaries in preparing this book. 
And then I thought, wow, that happened nine months almost to the day. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Anyway, uh, nine, uh, the nine-month period prior to my initiation into the OTO was perhaps the most traumatic time of my life up until that point. We were painfully poor, and my prospects, as usual, were dismal. And if you, you know, I was uh, trans transitioning from uh, a 14-year career in music uh, to uh, to real life. We were we were painfully poor. My prospects prospects, as usual, were dismal. My occult studies were a welcome escape, and I used them precisely for that purpose. I was especially passionate about my BOTA tarot lessons and was about to begin the painting of the 22 cards of the Major Arcana. Actually, I had just completed the, the Fool. One afternoon, Constance and I took the baby. Yes, so we're, we're talking... 1972, and drove to the market to buy whatever we could with the $15 I had just earned from giving guitar lessons. Constance, as usual, was a wise and frugal shopper and managed to spend less than $10. Using a coupon, she even bought us a special treat of half a pound of freshly ground Ethiopian Harar coffee, my last remaining drug of choice. When I gave up music, I dropped the recreational chemicals too. I couldn't wait to get home, get wired, and paint my first tarot card. Unfortunately, when we arrived home, we discovered that in the confusion of putting the baby in the car, we left our bag of precious groceries in the shopping cart. I got in the car and sped back to the store. It was too late. Our groceries were gone. I was furious. I was sick. I was crazy. I rushed back to the store and with our last five dollars, bought the baby's vegetables and in an act of obscene selfishness, another half pound of Ethiopian Harar. So this is 1972. You could, you could buy coffee. Okay. Anyway, I was so upset I could hardly drive. It was probably a good thing that I ran out of gas about six blocks from home. With no money for gas, I abandoned the car and walked home. And the car was, uh, my father My father had died that same year, and I inherited his previously, previously, previously owned Cadillac. My inheritance broke down on the way home. Okay. I abandoned the car and walked home. I handed Constance the baby's vegetables and without a word headed straight for the espresso machine. That's just one of those little stovetop espresso machines, not the thing. Okay. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of the level of our poverty. Okay. Uh, I packed it tightly full of that incredible coffee and stared at it until the mad hissing stopped. I poured myself a triple shot and locked myself in the bedroom with my paints and tarot cards. I finished the card in about two hours. That's that fool card. It was beautiful. After slugging down another triple espresso, I set my beautiful fool upon my little altar 
and stared at it until bedtime. Even though I was wired to the gills, I was very sleepy. I apologized to Constance for my crabbiness and fell instantly asleep. A chain of meaningless, unrelated dreams eventually put me behind the wheel of the car. I had to get it home. I had never abandoned it before. I wouldn't, it wouldn't start. Of course, it was out of gas. I got out of the car to do God knows what and bumped into what I can only describe as a leprechaun. He was about eight inches high, wore a black suit and a top hat that had been crushed to a co comic angle. I sat down in the street to get a better look. He had lamb chop sideburns and a nose like W.C. Fields. He produced a giant sized, well, it was a giant for him, is almost as big as his own body, a silver flask and unscrewed the top. I made it myself, he said as he offered it to me. One for the road. Drink it all. You've never had anything like it before. I made it myself. I took the flask and drained it. It had the smell and taste of fine whiskey, but without any of the bite or burn. Now, I, I don't know if you're kind of familiar with uh, uh, the, the advice or the caution about eating or drinking anything in a dream, but this was a, a most conspicuous act of taking strong spirits in a dream, so vivid that I could taste it. I became instantly drunk and was getting drunker by the second. The little man disappeared and I got back in the car and, and started it. I put the automatic gear shift to drive, only to find myself moving backwards. I put it in reverse and the whole car slid violently to the right. Finally, I somehow got it going straight ahead, but when I turned the steering wheel to the right, the car moved left and vice versa. I didn't know what to do. I slammed on the brakes, which made me go faster. Eventually, I crashed through a chain link fence and drove the car straight into a swimming pool. I opened the door and stepped out of the car and into the shallow pool. I was naked and covered in what looked like soap suds. I was no longer drunk. I felt clean and holy as if I had just been baptized. I waded to the shallow end of the pool and stepped out of the water. The sun was setting and it colored the sky with a most brilliant array of pastel colors. Everything in the vision was pastel. I saw no primary colors. A road skirted the swimming pool. It snaked to the horizon in wide lazy S's until it narrowed an exaggerated perspective and disappeared completely into the setting sun. I was witnessing a parade, a disorganized procession of the most exotic and whimsical creatures I had ever seen or imagined. No two were alike. They were humanoid. Most of them were tall and slender but each wore a different style and pastel-colored costume and hat. Each one was very attractive, but it was impossible to determine if they were male or female. 
or neither. The most amazing thing about them was their transparency. I could see through their bodies. I, I could see through their clothes. I could see through them. I thought to myself, these are elves or fairies. The creatures reacted to my thought with, a, with riotous approval and began playing gaily upon bizarre musical instruments. There were thousands of them stretching all the way to the sun. They marched past me. They waved and blew kisses at me. I was absolutely delighted, enchanted. Eventually, one of the elves broke rank and approached me. This one, I concluded, was female because she was the most delicately beautiful creature I'd ever seen. She's very thin and wore sheaths of transparent lavender that alternately clung tightly to her firm little body, then streamed lightly into the air around her. Her skin was light mauve and her hair transparent pink, bobbed in a classic pixie cut. She smiled at me as I recognized her as a mystical friend from a thousand unremembered dreams. She carried in her hand an octagonal paper box with thousands of little pink wheels painted on the sides. The wheels had spokes like the wheels that adorn the fool's jacket on the zero key of the tarot. The magician's robe has those spirit wheels. I wanted to tell her how happy I was to see her and ask her how we could meet again. Before I could phrase the words, she handed me the box and removed the lid. Whenever you want to be with me, you need only look into the box and say. Now then, suddenly, in the background, just like a cheap movie, suddenly from out of nowhere, a cosmic organist played an arpeggio. Taking it as her cue, she sang the following song to the tune of Silver Bells, Silver Bells, it's Christmas time in the city. And it was Nedura, Nedura, play by myself in the rain. It seemed perfectly logical to me at the time. I looked into the box. It was filled a quarter full with a light lavender powder. As I repeated the words, Nedera, Nedera, play by myself in the rain, my breath kicked up the powder and created great clouds of lavender dust that obscured the whole vision. I didn't know what any of it meant, but I suddenly became aware that I was experiencing a vision I knew that if I could wake myself up fast enough, I'd be able to write it all down before I forgot it. I didn't want to lose Nedera again. As I fought to regain consciousness, I looked at the little wheels on the box. They were all turning. The whole field of my vision was filled with turning wheels. I opened my eyes and still saw them turning on the walls and ceiling of my bedroom. I reached over and turned on the lamp. I could see everything in the room clearly, but I also continued to see thousands of turning wheels superimposed upon everything. I grabbed a pencil and an envelope I was using as a bookmark and quickly wrote down everything I could remember. Eventually, the wheels disappeared from my vision. Before I went back to sleep, I got up and turned the fool card face down on the altar. 
Medra never visited me again. For years, I tried in vain to invoke and evoke her by chanting her crazy little song while visualizing that octagonal box. I've investigated her name by using the Hebrew and Greek Kabbalah and failed to find anything significant, at least at, at the time. I even tried to conjure her into the Solomonic tri Triangle and summon her through the rites of which I'm forbidden to speak. All to no avail. She remains a mystery. Cartoon enough for you? Tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo. I think I have a little treat for you tomorrow uh, for Sunday school. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, so until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.